Okay, welcome everybody. I'm Joanne McFadden. I'm the Minister of New Thought New York Center for Spiritual Living. And I'm pleased to introduce Leonard Perlmutter, known as Ram Lev. He's the founder of the American Meditation Institute and originator of National Conscience Month in January. National Conscience Month was created to celebrate and raise awareness about the value of using your conscience as a guide to make better decisions. Mr. Pullmutter's first book, The Heart and Science of Yoga, was endorsed by Dean Ornish, MD, Larry Dossey, MD, and Bernie Siegel, MD. Over the past 26 years, he has served on the faculties of the New England Institute of Ayurvedic Medicine in Boston, Massachusetts, and the International Himalayan Yoga Teachers Association in Calgary, Canada. He has taught workshops on the benefits of the conscience, meditation, and yoga science at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, Kaiser Permanente, numerous medical schools, and the United States Military Academy at West Point, Association of Graduates. Since 2009, Leonard's foundation course on yoga science has been certified for continuing medical education credits by the American Medical Association and the American Nurses Association. So I'm excited to learn more about your book and the conscience. I found the book fascinating and very useful. So what exactly is the conscience? Well, first, I want to thank you for the invitation to be here with you. I appreciate it very much. The conscience is really a misunderstood part of our mind. Uh, it is actually the only function of the mind that can make a decision concerning what's to be done and what's not to be done. And when, when I learned that, it, it was uh, quite a realization because what it said to me was, every single decision that I have ever made and every single decision that I will ever make is always made by the conscience. You know, we often uh, think about the conscience as uh, being uh, that part of the mind that has, uh, you know, an angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other, and it, it, it is only available to us for these moral choices. But that's, that's not really true. Every decision we make is made by the conscience. But the conscience can make two different forms of decisions. And that depends on the other functions of the mind, which cannot make decisions, can only advise. That would be, namely, the ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind. So why is it so hard to follow the advice of the conscience? It's hard to uh, follow the advice of the conscience because there's so much noise in the mind. <laughs> you see, uh, the ego, the senses, and unconscious mind, because they, they cannot make a decision, they're very insistent in seeing that their suggestions are put into practice. And the ego is very interesting because the the ego reflects many of the same characteristics as the reptilian brain so both the reptilian brain and the ego are both heavily invested in self-preservation you know i don't want to die i don't want to lose control i don't want to be no more <laughs> Uh, and that's understandable. And both the reptilian brain and the conscience have this overwhelming fear continuously of annihilation. Because of that, 
the ego is very insistent on only experiencing pleasure because the ego equates change with some form of death, some form of annihilation, where the ego has to give up control. And when the ego feels that it has to give up control, oh my gosh, almost anything could happen <laughs> if, if I'm not uh, driving this bus. So the ego always insinuates itself into every relationship and defines it in two ways. One, it says, oh, this is very pleasant. I like it. Let's reprise this. Over here, on the other hand, is something that is very unpleasant. I dislike it. I consider this bad and the other good. So let's get rid of the bad and let's only experience what I can consider being the good. Well, that might be okay for a, a few uh, uh, experiences, but we already know from our personal experience what? That which appears as pleasant isn't always good for us. That which appears as unpleasant isn't always bad for us. So if we let the ego's noise carry the day, then we're going to be experiencing a whole lot of pain, which is exactly the experience that humanity is having today. A tremendous amount of pain, fear, anger. So that's the, that's the ego. Or their ego is often wrong, but not always, not always. We need a, a healthy ego to drive an automobile or a truck. We need a healthy ego to have a conversation like this and make sense. But the ego is often wrong. And it's insistent and loud and pushy and creates a tremendous amount of noise in the unconscious mind. Similarly, the senses, the second function of the mind, wastes a tremendous amount of our creative energy in search of happiness, in search of security, in search of health. My experience is that, that the ego is, a, is, is quite a bit nearsighted. It can, it can recognize what it believes is the pleasant. That's, that's true. But it never really considers the back of the front. Because on the back of everything that's pleasant, there is something that's painful. Because these pairs of opposites, they, they travel together. And in the absence of one, the other appears. So our mind has become addicted to projecting our creative energy through the senses. That's why we look, we smell, we taste, we hear, we touch or desire to do so, all in search of happiness, security, and health. And the senses are always endorsing the pleasant. So we wind up wasting a tremendous amount of our creative energy chasing all these rainbows that the senses insist have a pot of gold at the end of it. Mm -hmm. And so it's really a little bit like squeezing a tube of toothpaste. When we squeeze a tube of toothpaste, out comes the toothpaste quite easily. But if we ever try to put the toothpaste back in the tube, it's, it's, I, I've never even tried it, but I can't even imagine it. It would be quite a project. So once we, once the mind, which has be, already become addicted to sense gratification, extrudes our creative energy, you can't call it back. And yet we need a tremendous amount of creativity to deal and solve all of life's challenges. 
So that's the ego and the senses. They're very loud. They're very pushy. They're very insistent. They cannot make a decision. But they're lobbyists. Mm -hmm. Then the third function of the mind is the unconscious. That's our hard drive. You know, the software that operates the system. All of those things that you and I and every other human being deem essential to self-preservation are all stored in the unconscious mind. And unconscious habits are a million times more powerful than good intention. That's why we think the same things, we say the same things, and we do the same things day in, day out, expecting different outcomes. So when we, when we do not train or parent the ego senses and unconscious mind to support the wisdom of the conscience, they're loud, they're pushy, they create a tremendous amount of noise. And we experience this day in, day out now. The noise coming from the mind is just overwhelming. When that noise is in existence, the conscience, which can make the decision, that's the decision maker. But when there's too much noise in the mind, the only kind of decision that the conscience can make is to rubber stamp the loudest voice it can hear. And that's what brings about so much pain and unskillful lifestyle choices. However, if we begin to experiment with training and parenting and loving our ego senses and unconscious mind to help them to grow up and encourage them to present their perspective and then to quiet down. If we can train them and parent them to do that just for the sake of an experiment, which is not forever, it's just an experiment as a beginning, a middle and an end. When we can convince them to experiment like that, then the ego senses and unconscious mind will present their opinions and their suggestions, then quiet down. And when the mind is quiet, the mind is still, then the conscience has the capacity to act like a mirror, which can reflect super conscious wisdom from the super conscious portion of the mind at the center of consciousness within each of us. And it can reflect it from the super conscious portion of the mind into our conscious mind to, to suggest the thought to think, the word to speak, and the action to take that will enable each of us to fulfill the purpose of life without pain, misery, or bondage. So where does the conscience get its wisdom? Well, religionists would say it's our soul. You see, at the core of our being is consciousness, our awareness, and part of consciousness within consciousness resides an intuitive library of wisdom. That's not metaphor. It's not magic. It's not poetry or fancy. It's beyond the conscious mind. It's beyond the unconscious mind. It's the super conscious mind, the same portion of the mind where Paul McCartney hears beautiful melodies. The same portion of the mind where Albert Einstein saw mathematical equations. It doesn't mean that if we use the conscience that we're going to become songwriters or physicists. But what it does mean is the more that we can parent the ego senses and unconscious mind to create 
a quiet environment for the conscience to reflect this super conscious wisdom. And if we can exhibit our willpower to serve that wisdom in thought, word, and deed, we can begin resolving all of life's challenges. You talked about the four functions of the mind. Where does this framework come from? Well, it's, it's as old as humanity. The four functions of the mind were actually seen in the quietude of deep meditation by these women and men, just like you and, and I, who were in pain, filled with fear and anger and selfish desires. Their cultures too were a bit out of control. And they decided to experiment, not with continuing to try to find answers outside of themselves, but rather to go within, to seek within, and to find the truth at the core of their being. And then, once they receive that truth, to experiment with it in the form of their thoughts, their words, and their actions in the world. And all of a sudden, through that form of experimentation, they felt better physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And they passed that on to students who then became teachers, who then pass that on to other students. It's an oral tradition that dates back over 6,000 years. Born of personal experience, I might add, born of personal experience, which is the highest knowledge of all. Mm -hmm. Do you have to believe in God to trust your conscience? <laughs> well, the short answer is no. Uh, if, if you have a relationship with God, though, and you're experiencing lots of pain, misery, and bondage, perhaps you should find a new concept of God. Because if you really uh, can go beyond you if you can use your conscience to go beyond the pain misery and bondage of human life then i would say you have found god what is the law of karma and why are thoughts so important to it well the law of karma I'll, I'll demystify it for us because we all remember in fourth grade or fifth grade in science class, we, we learned that Newton came up with this uh, third law of motion. For every action, there's an equal reaction. Well, he was just restating the law of karma, which, as I said, dates five, 6,000 years uh, ago. And what it really uh, means is thoughts lead to actions. Now, actions can be thinking or speaking or physically acting in the world. But thoughts lead to action, and action always leads to consequence. So what's interesting to me is that every human being, I believe, already knows the consequence that we want to experience in every relationship. On some level, we all want to be happy. We all want to be secure. We all want a healthy mind and body. Then the question must be asked, how are we going to get to point B from point A? Do we have a business plan? Has anybody ever taught us about a business plan for happiness and health and security? Well, really not. My experience is the only thing that I really learned to do was to develop the conscious mind's capacity to memorize 
So our teachers, whether it was in grade school or high school or college or, or post-grad, it was all about memorizing, memorizing. And that can be uh, very helpful because uh, if I memorize uh, and concentrate on a certain subject matter and I get a degree, oh, then I, I, can, I can make a living for myself. But there's still a lot of noise in the mind and, and the ego senses an unconscious mind remains untrained and unparented. And so therefore I'm in pain and I'm making choices that are counter to my well-being. This is the human condition. You say there are only two kinds of thoughts. Can you describe them? Yeah, thoughts are very interesting. Uh, you know, it seems that our culture looks on thoughts as somewhat analogous to dirty pennies. Eh, they don't have much value. Eh, the, you know, they, they come, they go. They don't really have any meaning. Oh, no, not so. Thoughts are our, our most powerful resource. They're little packages. Uh, you know those uh, little packages of sugar uh, that you get at a, at a, at a nice restaurant uh, at the end of a meal uh, uh, for coffee or tea or something like that? That's what thoughts are. They're little packages of energy, creative energy. Mm -hmm. And so that creative energy can lead to speech and action and consequences. So knowing what kind of thoughts to give our attention to is critically important. You know, we all hear about junk food. Oh, junk food. Oh, that's junk food. I, I really shouldn't be eating that. But worse than junk food are junk thoughts. <laughs> yeah, junk thoughts. And if the truth be known, we're all addicted to junk thoughts. Mm -hmm. Think about all these thoughts that just flow into our consciousness, all this fear, all this anger, all this selfish desire from all these human beings and, and the internet and social media. Oh, it's overwhelming. Not only that, but things are changing at such a rapid rate. Situations that took thousands of years to change hundreds of years, centuries to change, take place now and change in nanoseconds. And it's very disturbing to human beings, very disturbing, because there's no security. There's nothing to hold on to. And nobody out there in the external world seems to have a handle on what's to be done. So there are two thoughts, two kinds of thoughts. They're, in Sanskrit, they rhyme, Freya and Shreya. I guess uh, they, they originally uh, used that so that we would remember. The Prayas are, they're very pleasant. They're comfortable, they're familiar, they're attractive, some form of ego, or sense gratification that conflicts, that conflicts with the superconscious wisdom of our conscience. And when we serve those preya thoughts, whether it's fear or anger or desire on any level, there's a passing pleasure that always is replaced with physical, mental, emotional, and or spiritual pain. And if we don't heed the lesson of pain at a low decibel level, the decibel level just rises and rises. It gets louder and louder until dis-ease and pain becomes a disease. Mm -hmm. It all starts in the mind, you see. It starts with thoughts. That's the prayer. Shreya is not so pleasant, not so comfortable, not so attractive, not so familiar, but 
It does have the good housekeeping seal of approval of the conscience, of the superconscious wisdom, and will always lead us for our highest and greatest good. So the ideal is to experiment with serving those Shreya thoughts, compassion, non-injury, non-stealing, you see, the golden rule. And insofar as the prayers are concerned, if we serve them, we'll be in pain. So that's not really acceptable. But we are free to repress those ego or sense gratification. But if we repress them, then we're going to become neurotic and we're going to be in a tremendous amount of pain. So if we don't want to serve these preya thoughts, ego or sense gratification that conflict with our superconscious wisdom, and we don't want to repress it, what are we going to do with it? Well, the answer lies in the word sacrifice, which comes from the Latin, and then the Italian, sacrifaci. We can make that sacred, those prayers, that fear, anger, and selfish desire. You see, these strong emotions like fear and anger and selfish desire, they are not bad. They are, in fact, our creative energy, but they are appearing in a form that is debilitating and contractive and often poisonous. So again, let's go back to the fifth grade science class. What do we learn about energy? Oh, energy can't be created nor destroyed, we learn, but it can be transformed. You know, we all did uh, those nice little uh, experiments uh, in fourth or fifth grade where we started with an ice cube, we added some heat, it turned into water, we heated it some more, and it created steam and gas. So if this contractive and debilitating and poisonous energy of fear and anger and selfish desires come into our awareness, are we obligated to accept them? No, but we can transform them because energy can be transformed and sacrificing them back to the origin from which they came. And what is the origin from which these contractive, debilitating, poisonous thoughts come from? Well, there's only one source of everything. That's what we learned, right? That's what we all believe, no matter what we call it. It's, it's G-O-D. <laughs> everything has come from G-O-D, no matter what you call it. Mm -hmm. So if you can willingly in real time, when you're driving to work and somebody mindlessly cuts you off in traffic, triggering anger from your unconscious mind into your conscious mind and you're aware of anger in real time if you can check with your conscience to ask is this a preya or a shreya the conscience will tell us oh this anger is a preya it's poisonous right now that you're aware of it consciously it's poisoning your entire physiology. <laughs> but if you can sacrifice it back to the origin from which it came, that contractive debilitating and poisonous energy can be transformed into healing energy, willpower, and an expansion of our creative capacity. But I have to advise people not to believe me, you see. Don't be dependent on what I'm saying. If you're interested and that piques your interest, experiment with it. Experiment with those kinds of choices and see how it makes you feel. I know how it made me feel. I felt better physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And that's why I'm here today with Joanne to, to discuss this.
So I'm betting that you'll feel better also. But you have to do the experiment for yourself. Then you'll own the truth. It will be received through your own personal experience. And that is the highest, most important knowledge that you will ever have for living life. Does the conscience really always know the difference between Preya and Shreya thoughts? If we can train the ego senses and conscious and, and unconscious mind to quiet down after they make their suggestions, yes. Yes. You see, the conscience doesn't really know that. The conscience is simply a pass-through. It can just reflect it. So it's not like the conscience has all this knowledge and that it's offering it to us. No, it's like the computer that, that we're operating right now. I know, Joanne, for example, that you are not in my computer. <laughs> and yet I see your image that is being broadcast somehow over these waves and it's appearing digitally on my screen. Mm -hmm. So the conscience is part of our mind. It's part of our hardware, the hardware of our mind. But it's unlike any other hardware of any other animal. Human beings are unique. We have a function of our mind that is part of the hardware, part of our mind body sense complex that can reflect wisdom from outside the matrix and can bring it into the matrix, into our conscious mind, so that we will know the thought to think, the word to speak, and the action to take that can resolve the seemingly unresolvable. So what kinds of problems can be solved by relying on the conscience? Well, I tell people that I have no problems. And I would, I would uh, suggest to people that they experiment with that too. What do I mean by that? I have no problems. Through my experience, I have realized that certain words in the English vocabulary because that is, that's my language, my, my language, uh, and that certain words in English, as in every language, are very triggering. They're very triggering. So I invite people to listen to the word. And let's just do that now as a little experiment. You and I can do it, and, and folks who are listening can do this as a little experiment for themselves. So if you feel comfortable, we can we can close our eyes and just bring the word problem into our heart center. And just listen to that word over and over problem, problem, problem. I have a problem. And as you're listening to it, feel the weight of it. And, and be aware of how it makes you feel. Now stay there, and instead of listening to the word problem, let's use a synonym, S situation. So just repeat the word situation, situation, situation. I have a situation. And examine as you're listening to that word, the weight of that, as opposed to the weight of problem, problem, problem. And then just open your eyes. So I'll ask you, Joanne, what did you experience? What's the difference? Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so with pro the word problem, a, a tightness and the heaviness, right? here in my uh, chest right. yep. rising right. up and um, with situation that being released. Yes, it's released. 
And it doesn't mean when I recognize that I have a situation, it doesn't mean that I don't have to work. <laughs> but um, it's only a situation. I'm up for it, right? But with the, with the word problem, problem, I can feel my creative energy just sinking and being locked up. I don't even want to can start to think about how I'm going to deal with this problem. But a situation, it's very animating. It's very energizing. So I ask people to examine the vocabulary that we use because it's triggering and, and it creates faulty concepts in our mind that diminish our creative energy. Um, is there an ex experiment that might be a little more challenging than that to try? Yeah, we'd like to do challenging things, <clears throat> but we should remember If we never worked out and we never built muscles in our body consciously <clears throat> through an exercise program and we're in the middle of our life, we're in the afternoon of life and we figure that, oh, well, you know, I think I, I, think I should uh, do some exercises and build up my muscle. Okay, well, the last thing that I should do is to go to the gym and start picking up 200 pounds. Why? Because it would hurt me. It would be injurious. So instead, I just start with a couple of pounds. And after a week or so, I'll add another pound or two. And then a couple more weeks, a couple more pounds. Within a month or two, I'm lifting some substantial weight and I'm gaining muscle. So in the experiment process <clears throat> where we want to parent the ego senses and unconscious mind, it's critically important, critically important that we don't give the ego senses and unconscious mind things that are too challenging for them. We want to give them easy to do, no brainers. So let's say that we just finished a nice dinner. And then the question comes up, are we going to brush our teeth? <laughs> okay, so uh, only the conscience can make the decision. But for sure, the ego senses and unconscious mind are all going to have strong opinions. The ego is going to be against it right away. Because that's not pleasant. And the ego always defines any kind of change, especially if the advice comes from the conscience, <clears throat> and so it doesn't want to give up control. So right away, <clears throat> the ego is against that idea. Senses, same thing. Senses don't want to brush the teeth. Senses wants a second slice of apple pie. <laughs> Right? I mean, you know, this is the truth, right? And the unconscious mind, you know, just lives in its habit patterns. And, and, and so many of the habits are the, are, are the opinions of the ego and the senses. So th the unconscious mind usually goes along because that's its habit. Mm -hmm. So it's up to me then to convince the ego, the sen senses and unconscious mind to experiment just take a time out for two minutes and brush the teeth and then come back and we'll discuss what it was like. So it's relatively easy. So we do, we go in, we brush the teeth, we come out and then me, the parent, again, initiates a conversation. Ego, how was that experience for you? And the ego will tell us it wasn't as bad as I, as I feared. And I didn't die. <laughs> uh huh. It wasn't so bad. And I'm not really resentful uh, of the conscience. The uh, senses, same thing. The senses will have a good experience, you see. Chiefly because 
And the senses will tell you right away. I wasn't really sure that I would like it, but all of a sudden, I experienced the tongue gliding over my front teeth. And you know what was missing? Moss. <laughs> and I really dislike that mossy feeling on my teeth. So now my teeth feel real clean. That's neat. And the unconscious mind, too, experienced something that was positive. So what does that mean? I gave them an easy experiment. It was a no-brainer. Only took a couple of minutes. They had a good experience. They trust me more. And they trust the conscience more. As long as the experiment is relatively easy. So if it's 10 o'clock at night. And you're watching TV. You're just trying to relax before going to bed and a coffee commercial comes on the television right away the ego the senses and the unconscious mind are already halfway into the kitchen thinking about a cup of coffee a couple of uh, teaspoons of sugar maybe some half and half and definitely definitely a leftover piece of apple pie from dinner <laughs> That's, you know, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. But the conscience will, will say, if we can quiet the ego senses and unconscious mind, 10 o'clock at night is not an appropriate time for a cup of coffee. Especially since we only have caffeinated coffee in the house. And you know that you need a good night's sleep because you have a very important business meeting in the morning. If we had the same conversation at, say, 7 o'clock in the morning, maybe I would say, have a cup of coffee. But at 10 o'clock at night, it's a prayer to be sacrificed and transformed into healing energy, willpower, and creativity. So it becomes fun. It's very entertaining. What does one pointed attention mean? Well, one pointed attention does not mean multitasking. <laughs> so that's, that's the culture's suggestion for us on how to be a success in the world, which is really an oxymoron because everybody knows it's impossible to multitask. In order for us to experience the delusion of multitasking so that we can make the culture happy or our employer happy what has to happen copious amounts of adrenaline have to surge through our entire body so that the mind can go back and forth back and forth between two objects very quickly and what's the bottom line there the mind becomes depressed and the immune system becomes depressed. But one pointed attention, one pointed attention, that which we learn in meditation creates automatically when all the creative energy of the mind is focused on only one object to the exclusion of all others automatically there comes a space between stimulus and response the stimulus is a distracting thought let's say in meditation and what is my response to it with one pointed attention i automatically develop a space between stimulus and response and what's inside that space my freedom of action it gives me time you see before i take an action in relationship to the stimulus i can check with my conscience to determine if that distraction is a shreya to be served or a prayer to be sacrificed so with one pointed attention I create a space between stimulus and response that brings me 
creativity through the conscience from the super conscious portion of the mind. And if I can follow that advice, I will be building my the muscles of my willpower to do what's to be done, when it's to be done, and not do what's not to be done when it's not to be done. These are the benefits of a one-pointed mind. Do you want to keep going with more questions or take questions from the attendees? Uh, I'd be delighted to take uh, questions from attendees or whatever questions you had. It's, it's really uh, whatever you would like. Are there uh, questions available to us in the uh, Q&A? Um, yes. Okay. So um, if anyone has a question, uh, type it in the chat and then I will pose it. Um, and while we're waiting for that to happen, um, is it is it exhausting to rely on the conscience all the time? Okay, well, I can answer that with a question. Do you remember when you were 16? Yes. And you learned to drive? Mm -hmm. Right. Oh my gosh. Remember all those things? And, you know, you never drove before. So, it, you know, it was kind of uh, tense uh, sometimes. Uh, how, how much am I going to turn the wheel to the left? How much am I going to turn the wheel to the right? Uh, how am I going to stop this automobile without uh, jerking? How am I going to uh, start the car at a red light when it turns green so that it doesn't jerk? Uh, and so I'm constantly thinking about all these different things, and it's, you know, it's exhausting. But now I have a global skill. And all there is is driving, and it can be a delight. It's the same with using our conscience. It's not exhausting. We just create a global skill. And, you know, my experience is human beings are habit makers. We're really good at making habits, and we're really good at giving our attention to creating a habit to create a global skill. So it just becomes a new way of being. And it's it's a very motivating way of being because you have less pain. Okay, we do have a couple of questions. Oh, good. One is, what is the role for meditation in our lives? Well, meditation trains the mind. And I spoke to that uh, a moment ago because the skills that we receive in seated meditation, whether it's with a mantra, a word, or a series of words containing the name of the supreme intelligence that we refer to as G-O-D, or it could be a breath meditation where you just be aware of the inhalation and the exhalation as it goes here to the bridge between the two nostrils where the nostrils meet the upper lip, and you're just aware of that breath going in and the exhalation going out. But if you begin to do things like this, either a mantra meditation or a breath meditation, only do it for 60 seconds. Don't take on too much too soon. You'll be able to experience something very beneficial and recognize that in the meditation process, it's not about getting rid of thoughts. It's about learning how to direct the traffic. So when you give your attention to a mantra or the breath, the mind is going to want to change the channel. It's going to look for something more interesting, more pleasurable. So it's going to want to change the channel. And so you might be aware of the mantra. You might be aware of the breath. But then all of a sudden, there's a distraction, a thought, an image, a sound. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that you're a failure. It just means, oh, that's the habit of the mind. 
And it's also part of meditation to train the mind. So whenever a distraction comes, you don't push it away. You're not upset or angry with yourself that you are a poor meditator. You simply honor and witness whatever the distraction is, sacrifice it back to the origin from which it came, and bring the mind back to either the mantra or the breath. Uh, let's see, we have a few more here. Uh, is there a third entity between the praya and shreya, one which is pleasing to the ego or senses and for the greater good? Well, the beautiful thing about life and this whole philosophy and this science is that which was a praya can turn into a shreya. And that which was a Shreya can turn into a Preya. So if, for example, you're invited for dinner uh, to, your, to your neighbors or your, or your friends, and uh, the, the couple cooks all day and bakes all day uh, for you, and, and, uh, and you have a, a wonderful meal, and then, and then the, uh, the a dessert comes out. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's pumpkin pie. I love pumpkin pie. And so, uh, say the, uh, the host or the hostess comes over and would you like a, uh, a slice of uh, pumpkin pie? And maybe I'm uh, trying to lose a couple of pounds. But, hey, I have a body. I have senses. Life is to be enjoyed. Uh, I really love uh, pumpkin pie. And what does the conscience say? Have a piece of apple pie, have a, a piece of pumpkin pie and enjoy it thoroughly without any guilt. And so I do, and I finish it, it was delicious. And then the host or the hostess comes over again. How was that? Oh, it was fantastic, I say. Oh, have a second piece. Oh, that which was a Shreya and I experienced it without guilt, now, the conscience advises, oh, now it's turned into a prayer. It's the same pumpkin pie, only a different slice of it, but now it's automatically a prayer. And it can work the other way around. You see, it could be a prayer first, and then all of a sudden it's a shreya. So you don't know unless you're in the moment, unless you're in the present moment, and you're listening to the wisdom reflected by the conscience. Uh, here's another question. Do you have a favorite affirmation? Favorite affirmation. <laughs> I guess that uh, maybe, I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's a good one. And that is that every single thought that comes into your awareness is only a suggestion of what to give your attention to. It is not an imperial command. Every thought is only a suggestion. And only the conscience can reflect superconscious wisdom to tell us which thoughts are to be served and which are to be sacrificed. Okay, and there's one more question here. What do you think is the highest collective purpose for humanity? Gee, you got anything easier? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, here's my answer. I believe that uh, uh, the purpose of life is, is really is to know who we are, from where we have come, why we are here, what's to be done, and where we will go when the body is no more. And how can people learn more about your teaching? Well, we have a website. We're 
we teach at the American Meditation Institute. And the website is AmericanMeditation.org, AmericanMeditation.org. And right on the homepage, you'll see a notice for a free Sunday guided meditation and philosophical talk, just like you and I have had uh, today, Joanne. And it's free. You just click and register. You'll have access, and then you'll get a free uh, recording that you can use during the week. And everything that I have mentioned today is presented in a coherent curriculum known as the AMI Foundation course. And we'll be having a new six-week foundation course beginning in February on Saturday afternoons. And that, too, is on the home page of the American Meditation .org. Are there any other concluding remarks that you want to make before we close? Well, uh, we have a new book. It's called Your Conscience. And you've you've indicated that you have read it and uh, enjoyed it. And there it is right there. Uh, and that's available at all fine booksellers, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere where fine books are sold. And so uh, if you're interested in experimenting, that would be a good, uh, uh, a good way to start. Has a lot of experiments in, in the back of the book. The second half of the book is all about experimenting. Yes, yes, I, I enjoyed a lot of those. And I, I think I need to put a sign that says Preya or Shreya on my refrigerator. <laughs> yeah, I, I do that all the time. I, I, I have post-its all over the place uh, to remind me, to remind me, because one thing is certain, human beings tend to forget. I mean, you know, so that's, that's all part of the rules of the game. You know, we forget. Okay, so we forget, but we can help ourselves uh, and post-its uh, is a wonderful vehicle for that, just to just sort of jolt us. Wake well, us thank up. you, thank you um, so much for this conversation. And um, the I did I did really love the book. Um, so thank you for introducing me to that. Also, it's a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, thank you for everyone who uh, attended and participated.